In one of the previous videos, we actually determined how you get from Coulomb's law to this potential energy-like equation, which is the equation for lattice energy. All right, and the lattice energy equation is actually relatively simple. In fact, it's exactly the potential energy equation that you might have saw in might have seen in physics too, or something like that. Okay, and the equation is simple because there's a lot of assumptions that go into this. Now think back to whenever you first learned about the ideal gas equation. All right? The ideal gas equation is just that. It's ideal. It's used for ideal situations, and it's really just more of an approximation. In fact, in many cases, you have great deviations from ideality. Because in reality, nothing really behaves ideally. It behaves in a real way because this is reality, right? So anytime you have real gas equations, like the van der Waals equation of state, the equation becomes a lot more complicated. So what we're going to talk about in this video is actually some complications that come from this equation because it's too simplistic. And that's going to lead us to talking about real lattice behavior. And we're going to talk first about the Madeline constant. All right. So hopefully what you see up here at the top right is you have at least part of the expression for the lattice energy. E is equal to A times Z plus times Z minus divided by D, the interionic radius. However, they've thrown in this constant M, and that's what's referred to as the Madelung constant. Now the Madelung constant, what it is, is it's a, it's a proportionality constant or factor. And one thing that we have to realize is, and this goes into uh, this uh, constant and also the next thing called the Born exponent that we're going to look at, there's an assumption that goes into a lot of um, equations, including the ideal gas equation, and that's that atoms are simply just hard shells. They're just spheres that take up a certain amount of space, and they don't compress, they don't extend, um, they're just there. They're just hard shells, and they, and they have sort of a constant charge throughout them. Well, hopefully what we realize is that by now, the charge is not uniform throughout the sphere. Okay, We have different orbitals that have electrons in certain places, and so there's actually different geometries to where the charge is in the atom. And so the Madeline constant deals with attractive forces, okay? It takes into account any attractive forces that, that cause deviations because of the geometry of the interactions, okay? The way I would think about it just conceptually is certain orbitals, like d orbitals, for example, have different geometries where electrons are not in a certain place in the sphere. They're only in a certain area. And so that can cause problems and deviations from ideality. The Madeline constant helps to fix that, and then all the Madeline constants are tabulated in these tables. So if you need to figure out what the Madeline constant is, you just figure out what crystal structure you have, and there's a Madeline constant that goes with that. So if we had a calcium fluoride crystal structure, we would use the Madeline constant 2.52. And these are tabulated, and your instructor will probably provide you with those on the exam and they're experimentally determined. So if I want to, uh, to uh, take into account the attractive forces that are due to sort of ge uh, differences in geometry between the different interactions, I use the Madeline constant. Unfortunately, this does not take into account repulsive forces and other deviations due to that. So for that, we have to do something a little more complicated, and that's by using the Born exponent. All right, so this term right here, this is the repulsion um, at least the lattice energy con contribution due to the repulsion, it's equal to B, which is just a constant, divided by D to the N, where D is the interionic distance and N is the Born exponent. All right, so one thing that I mentioned is that in a lot of um, equations that you have, there is an assumption that atoms are just hard shells, they don't compress, they don't extend, the charge is uniform throughout them, etc., etc. But we know this is not the case. Atoms can actually be compressed. Okay, and that leads to some error when it comes to uh, the lattice energy in particular because you can have some repulsive forces and that actually can cause, when you have repulsion, particularly between nuclei, uh, that can actually cause um, atoms to compress when you have repulsion and that can actually screw up the, the accuracy of the lattice energy calculation. So what we're going to do is we're going to determine something called a Born exponent. And the Born exponent n is based on the principal quantum number of the outermost electron. 
And you have tables like this where you have principal quantum number outermost electron, one through five, that's usually all we're gonna deal with, and then the Born exponent that goes with that. So if you were to determine that the principal quantum number of the outermost electron was a four, then it would have a Born exponent of 10, and so on and so forth. It's pretty straightforward. The only thing that's actually any work is actually determining the principal quantum number of the outermost electron. So that's what we're gonna look at. And we have some examples here where we want to actually calculate uh, the, or determine, we're not calculating, but determining the Born exponent. Let's do some examples. Let's look at lithium plus. So on the next slide, I actually have a periodic table. So we're gonna look at lithium plus and we need to determine the principal quantum number of the outermost electron. Here's lithium. Now you might be tempted to say it's two, but remember it has a plus charge. So this 2s1 electron is lost. So that means lithium plus has two electrons, meaning it, its electron configuration is two, or excuse me, it's 1s2. The outermost electron is right here. And so that means the principal quantum number of that outermost electron is a one, which means that lithium plus would have a Born exponent of five. Okay, let's look at bromide. This is Br minus, all right. So bromine picks up an electron and has an electron configuration of krypton, all right. Now what is the principal quantum number of the outermost electron? Well, this is in a 4p orbital, okay. So that means it's a four, all right. And if it's a four, that means the Born exponent is 10. Okay, so for bromide, it would be 10. All right, now let's look at zinc two plus. This is gonna be an interesting one, actually. So zinc is right here. Now zinc two plus, you might say, oh, well, you know, it loses this one and has an electron configuration of nickel. No, if you actually think back to some of your electron configuration, zinc actually, um, when we talked about d orbital chemistry, it's a d10 which means it still has all of these, and the reason for that is whenever you have transition metals, there's a tendency to lose the electrons first that are in the s orbitals over here in that row. So when you have zinc two plus, it's gonna lose these two, meaning it's gonna have its electrons in the, these d orbitals. So it has no 4s electrons. It's all gonna be in the, uh, with a principal quantum number of three. Okay, so for zinc 2 plus, its principal quantum number of the outermost electron is going to be 3 because it lost the 4s2, both of them, and so its Born exponent is going to be 9. Okay, let's look at oxide, O2 minus. So here's oxygen. It's going to pick up two electrons and have the electron configuration of neon. This is in a 2p orbital, and so it's going to have a principal quantum number of the outermost electron of two, which means oxide will have a Born exponent of seven. Okay, now that's sufficient when we want to calculate the uh, Born exponent for individual ions, but we rarely ever have individual ions. They're always in a compound. So we want to find the average Born exponents, and that's going to be important. What did we say it was for lithium? It was five. We have a Born exponent of five for lithium, and for bromide, it's gonna be 10. So if we wanna find the average, we're just gonna average five and 10. And it turns out for lithium bromide, that's gonna be 7.5, because it's gonna be five plus 10, which is 15, divided by two, 7.5. Okay, let's do the same thing for zinc oxide. What did we say it was for zinc? For zinc, it lost the 4s2 electrons, so its outermost is in a 3d, so it's three, which means it has a Born exponent of nine. And for oxide, I believe it was two, so it's gonna be, for oxide, it will be seven. So we have seven and nine, we take the average of that. So for zinc oxide, the average Born exponent should be an eight, okay? It turns out that, the, that calculating the average Born exponent is gonna be really important because when we have a, a lattice structure that has two different ions, whenever we do the what's called the Born-Landa equation, which we're gonna cover in the next video, we're actually going to need to actually, for this n, we need to take the average Born exponent of the two species in the lattice, okay? So ultimately, let's look at this again, and then we're gonna, that's gonna lead us into the Born-Landa equation. All right, in the next video, we're gonna show an equation that shows how this is actually useful when we wanna calculate um, real lattice energy or things that approach reality.
And it's, that's going to be an equation called the Born-Landa equation. And the reason we went through the trouble of calculating the average Born exponents is because when we use the Born-Landa equation, we're going to, probably going to have two species in the lattice, and we actually need to calculate the average of them to use it for n. Remember, we're going to have an exponent of n, so we're actually going to have to calculate the average Born exponent. And we're going to cover the Born-Landa equation in the next video. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.